Chapter 2 How Not to See a Person A few years ago, I was sitting at a bar near my home in Washington, D.C. If you'd been there that evening, you might have looked at me and thought, sad guy drinking alone. I would call it diligent scholar reporting on the human condition. I was nursing my bourbon, checking out the people around me. Because the bar was in D.C., there were three guys at a table behind me talking about elections and swing states. The man with his laptop at the table next to them looked like a junior IT officer who worked for a defense contractor. He had apparently acquired his wardrobe from the garage sale after the filming of Napoleon Dynamite. Down the bar there was a couple gazing deeply into their phones. Right next to me was a couple apparently on a first date, with the guy droning on about himself while staring at a spot on the wall about six feet over his date's head. As his monology hit its tenth minute, I sensed that she was silently praying that she might spontaneously combust, so at least this date could be over. I felt the sudden urge to grab the guy by the nose and scream, for the love of God just once ask her a question. I think this impulse of mine was justified, but I'm not proud of it. In short, everybody had their eyes open, and nobody seemed to be seeing each other. We were all, in one way or another, acting like diminishers. And in truth, I was the worst of them, because I was doing that thing I do, the size up. The size up is what you do when you first meet someone, you check out their look, and you immediately start making judgments about them. I was studying the bartender's Chinese character tattoos and drawing all sorts of conclusions about her sad singer-slash-indie rock musical tastes. I used to make a living doing this. Just over two decades ago I wrote a book called Bobos in Paradise. Doing research for that book, I followed people around places like the clothing and furniture store Anthropology, watching them thumb through nubby Peruvian shawls. I'd case people's kitchens, checking out the AGA stove that looked like a nickel-plated nuclear reactor right next to their massive sub-zero fridge, because apparently mere zero wasn't cold enough for them. I'd make some generalizations and riff on the cultural trends. I'm proud of that book. But now I'm after bigger game. I'm bored with making generalizations about groups. I want to see people deeply, one by one. You'd think this would be kind of easy. You open your eyes, direct your gaze, and see them. But most of us have all sorts of inborn proclivities that prevent us from perceiving others accurately. The tendency to do the instant size up is just one of the diminisher tricks. Here are a few others, egotism. The number one reason people don't see others is that they are too self-centered to try. I can't see you because I'm all about myself. Let me tell you my opinion. Let me entertain you with the story about myself. Many people are unable to step outside of their own points of view. They are simply not curious about other people. Anxiety The number two reason people don't see others is that they have so much noise in their own heads, they can't hear what's going on in other heads. How am I coming across? I don't think this person really likes me. What am I going to say next to appear clever? Fear is the enemy of open communication. Naive realism. This is the assumption that the way the world appears to you is the objective view, and therefore everyone else must see the same reality you do. People in the grip of naive realism are so locked into their own perspective, they can't appreciate that other people have very different perspectives. 
you may have heard the old story about a man by a river. A woman standing on the opposite shore shouts to him, how do I get to the other side of the river? And the man shouts back, you are on the other side of the river. The Lesser Minds Problem University of Chicago psychologist Nicholas Epley points out that in day-to-day -day life we have access to the many thoughts that run through our own minds. But we don't have access to all the thoughts that are running through other people's minds. We just have access to the tiny portion they speak out loud. This leads to the perception that I am much more complicated than you deeper, more interesting, more subtle, and more high-minded. To demonstrate this phenomenon, Epley asked his business school students why they were going into business. The common answer was I care about doing something worthwhile. When he asked them why they thought other students at the school were going into business, they commonly replied, for the money. You know, because other people have lesser motivations, and lesser minds. Objectivism. This is what market researchers, pollsters, and social scientists do. They observe behavior, design surveys, and collect data on people. This is a great way to understand the trends among populations of people, but it's a terrible way to see an individual person. If you adopt this detached, dispassionate, and objective stance, it's hard to see the most important parts of that person, her unique subjectivity, her imagination, sentiments, desires, creativity, intuitions, faith, emotions, and attachments the cast of this unique person's inner world. Over the course of my life, I've read hundreds of books by academic researchers who conduct studies to better understand human nature, and I've learned an enormous amount. I've also read hundreds of memoirs and spoken with thousands of people about their own singular lives, and I'm here to tell you that each particular life is far more astounding and unpredictable than any of the generalizations scholars and social scientists make about groups of people. If you want to understand humanity, you have to focus on the thoughts and emotions of individuals, not just data about groups. Essentialism People belong to groups, and there's a natural human tendency to make generalizations about them, Germans are orderly, Californians are laid back. These generalizations occasionally have some basis in reality. But they are all false to some degree, and they are all hurtful to some degree. Essentialists don't recognize this. Essentialists are quick to use stereotypes to categorize vast swaths of people. Essentialism is the belief that certain groups actually have an essential and immutable nature. Essentialists imagine that people in one group are more alike than they really are. They imagine that people in other groups are more different from us than they really are. Essentialists are guilty of stacking. This is the practice of learning one thing about a person, then making a whole series of further assumptions about that person. If this person supported Donald Trump, then this person must also be like this, 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 and this. The Static Mindset some people formed a certain conception of you, one that may even have been largely accurate at some point in time. But then you grew up. You changed profoundly. And those people never updated their models to see you now for who you really are. If you're an adult who has gone home to stay with your parents and realized that they still think of you as the child you no longer are, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm breaking out these diminisher proclivities to emphasize that seeing another person well is the hardest of all hard problems. Each person is a fathomless mystery, and you have only an outside view of who they are. The second point I'm trying to make is this, 
the untrained eye is not enough. You'd never think of trying to fly a plane without going to flight school. Seeing another person well is even harder than that. If you and I are relying on our untrained ways of encountering others, we won't be seeing each other as deeply as we should. We'll lead our lives awash in social ignorance, enmeshed in relationships of mutual blindness. We'll count ourselves among the millions of emotional casualties, husbands and wives who don't really see each other, parents and children who don't really know each other, colleagues at work who might as well live in different galaxies. It's disturbingly easy to be ignorant of the person right next to you. As you'll discover over the course of this book, I like to teach through examples, so let me tell you about a case that illustrates how you can think you know someone well without really knowing them. It's from Vivian Gornick's classic 1987 memoir Fierce Attachments. Gornick was 13 when her father died of a heart attack, and her mother, Bess, was 46. Bess had always enjoyed the status of seeming to be the one woman in her working-class Bronx apartment building in a happy, loving marriage. Her husband's death undid her. At the funeral parlor she tried to climb into the coffin with him. At the cemetery she tried to throw herself into the open grave. For years after she would be deranged by paroxysms of grief, suddenly thrashing around on the floor, veins bulging, sweat flying. My mother's grief was primitive and all-encompassing, it sucked the oxygen out of the air, Gornick wrote in that memoir. Her mother's grief consumed everybody else's grief, gathered the world's attention on her, and reduced her children to props in her drama. Afraid to sleep alone, Bess would pull Vivian close, but Vivian, repelled, would lie like a granite column, in this intimacy without togetherness that would last a lifetime. She made me sleep with her for a year, and for twenty years afterward I could not bear a woman's hand on me. For a while it seemed that Bess would grieve herself to death, instead, grief became her way of living. Widowhood provided Mama with a higher form of being, Gornick wrote. In refusing to recover from my father's death she had discovered that her life was endowed with a seriousness her years in the kitchen had denied her, mourning Papa became her profession, her identity, her persona. Vivian spent her adult years trying to win some measure of independence from this dominating, difficult, and thoroughly mesmerizing mother. But she kept getting drawn back. The two Gornick women would take long walks through New York City. They were both highly critical, vehement, dismissive masters of the New York verbal put-down. They were intimate antagonists, both angry. My relationship with my mother is not good, and as our lives accumulate it seems to worsen, Vivian wrote. We are locked into a narrow channel of acquaintance, intense and binding. In Vivian's memoir, part of what divides them is personal the record of hurts they've inflicted on each other. She's burning and I'm glad to let her burn. Why not? I'm burning too but part of it is also generational. Bess is a woman of the 1940s and 1950s urban working class and sees the world through that prism. Vivian is a woman of 1960s and 1970s liberal arts academia and sees the world through that prism. Vivian thinks Bess and her generation of women should have fought harder against sexism all around them. Bess thinks Vivian's generation has taken the nobility out of life. One day while they're walking, Bess blurts out, a world full of crazies. Divorce everywhere, what a generation you all are. Vivian shoots back, don't start, ma. 
I don't want to hear that bullshit again. Bullshit here, bullshit there. It's still true. Whatever else we did, we didn't fall apart in the streets like you're all doing. We had order, quiet, dignity. Families stayed together, and people lived decent lives. That's a crock, Vivian responds. They didn't live decent lives, they lived hidden lives. They eventually agree that people were equally unhappy in both generations, but, Bess observes, the unhappiness is so alive today. They both pause, startled, and enjoy the observation. Vivian is briefly proud of when her mother says a clever thing, comes close to loving her. Still, Vivian is struggling to be recognized, to have the kind of mother who understands the effect she has on her own daughter. She doesn't know I take her anxiety personally, feel annihilated by her depression. How can she know this? She doesn't even know I'm there. Were I to tell her that it's death to me, her not knowing I'm there, she would stare at me out of her eyes crowding up with puzzled desolation, this young girl of 77, and she would cry angrily, you don't understand. You have never understood. When Bess is 80, the tenor of their relationship softens as they both seem more aware that death is closing in. Bess even shows some self-awareness, I had only your father's love. It was the only sweetness in my life. So I loved his love. What could I have done? Vivian is angry. She reminds her mother that she was only 46 when her husband died. She could have created another life. Why don't you go already? Bess snaps. Why don't you walk away from my life? I'm not stopping you. But their attachment is unbreakable. Vivian's retort is the final sentence of the book, I know you're not, Ma. Fierce attachments is a brilliant description of seeing but not really seeing. Here are two smart, dynamic, highly verbal women in lifelong communication who are never quite able to understand each other. Gornick's book is so good because it illustrates that even in cases where we're devoted to a person, and know a lot about them, it's still possible to not see them. You can be loved by a person yet not be known by them. Part of the reason the Gornicks can't see each other is because they pay attention only to the effect the other has on them. Vivian and Bess are belligerents locked in a struggle over where the blame is going to lie. Part of the problem is Bess. Bess is so involved in her own drama that she never sees from her daughter's point of view, or even notices the effect she has on her daughter. But some of the problem lies with Vivian, too. Her intent in writing fierce attachments had been to create a voice that could finally stand up to her mother, and to figure out a way to detach from her. But Vivian is so busy trying to break free, she never really asks, who is my mother, apart from her relationship with me? What was her childhood like and who were her parents? We never get to see how Bess experiences the world, who she might be outside of her relationship with her daughter. In essence, mother and daughter are so busy making their own case, they can't get inside the other's perspective. I'm haunted by a phrase Vivian uses in the book, she doesn't even know I'm there. Her own mother doesn't know she's there. How many people suffer through this feeling? Being an illuminator, seeing other people in all their fullness, doesn't just happen. It's a craft, a set of skills, a way of life. Other cultures have words for this way of being. The Koreans call it nunchi, the ability to be sensitive to other people's moods and thoughts. 
The Germans, of course, have a word for it, Herzensbildung, training one's heart to see the full humanity in another. What exactly are these skills? Let's explore them, step by step.